In this video, we're going to be looking at topic 10C of the organic chemistry for AS. We are looking at alcohols, which is part of the halogenoalkanes, alcohols and spectra topic. So the learning outcomes that we're going to be covering are the nomenclature and how to draw alcohols, being able to classify them as primary, secondary or tertiary, looking at specific reactions of alcohols, including how to halogenate them and also how to oxidize them and looking at the techniques of how to prepare or purify an, a liquid organic compound and then we'll do some past paper questions at the end so alcohols are a homologous series with the general formula cnh2n plus one oh so of course they are not hydrocarbons because we have this hydroxyl group that is being attached to it the formula can sometimes be simplified to ROH, where R is any alkyl group, for example, ethyl or propyl, and the OH, of course, being our hydroxyl group. The way that we name these is very similar to our branched alkanes, alkenes, and our halogenal alkanes. The one thing that we must ensure that we do is we identify the location of the hydroxyl group, because we can get structural isomers, as we can see here, that we can have propan 2 but we can also have propan one all. And as we'll see as we go through this topic, these two things can have different reactions. So it's very important that we understand that. If we have more than one alcohol group, then we use our prefixes. So diol would mean two, and triol would mean three. You wouldn't have any more than three that could possibly come up. So we can classify alcohols as primary, secondary or tertiary, depending on the number of alkyl groups that are attached. This is exactly the same way that we classify halogenal alkenes. So if you've watched that video, then you'll remember that we classify primary as if they have one alkyl group or one R group attached. Secondary will have two R groups attached and tertiary will have three R groups being attached to the carbon that contains the OH. It is very important that we can classify all of our alcohols because as we've said, they do react in very different ways. <clears throat> so there are four reactions of alcohols that you must be able to identify and these are combustion, conversion to halogenal alkenes, dehydration to alkenes and oxidation. Good thing is you are not required to know the mechanisms of these reactions. Some of these mechanisms may come up when you go into A2, but we don't need to worry about them at AS level. So if we start off with the combustion, well, alcohols, as we already know, are very, very flammable. So they can undergo complete combustion with oxygen. And similar to the hydrocarbons, they are going to form carbon dioxide and water. We've actually discussed this already back in topic four when we discussed biofuels. Please make sure that you are able to write out the complete combustion of, eth of alcohols such as ethanol. So you're going to have your alkyl group with your OH reacting with your oxygen to form your carbon dioxide and your water. This could easily be a one or two mark question in an exam. We can convert our alcohols into halogenal alkanes and this involves replacing this hydroxyl group, so our OH, with a halogen and that halogen could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine or iodine. Now we're only going to focus on chlorine, bromine or iodine and the, we call these halogenation reactions. Now each halogen requires a, a different method and different reagents. You must be able to name all of the conditions and all of the reagents required for each of the reactions. So let's start off with chlorination. Well, there are two different chlorinations that we have to know. If we have a primary or a secondary alcohol such as propan 1 ol or propan 2 ol then we have to react the alcohol with phosphorus 5 chloride at room temperature which is this PCl5 here and you can see that we're going to make our halogenal alkane plus POCl3 and HCl. If it is a tertiary alcohol such as the one shown here we will react it with concentrated hydrochloric acid at room temperature and we form tertiary halogenal alkane and water as well. For bromination, the reagents are a mixture of potassium bromide and 
concentrated sulfuric acid and we have to warm this mixture as well. So we have two different parts that are reacting and we can then form our HBr. So we have our KBr reacting with our sulfuric acid depending on which route it takes, it doesn't matter, and we make our HBr which then reacts with the alcohol to form our, brom our alkyl bromide. For iodination, the reagents are a mixture of red phosphorus and iodine, which are heated under reflux. So we have our phosphorus and our iodine forming this PI3, and PI3 then reacts with our alcohol, and we form our iodoalkane. Please make sure that you can write out the equations for each of these, and you may wish to add these to your organic map to show all of your reactions and check on the YouTube channel for a video to show you how to do that. So dehydration to alkenes is another reaction that we have to know and we do this by heating the alcohol with concentrated phosphoric acid or H3PO4. This is very similar to a halogen sorry, an elimination reaction that we've seen in the halogenal alkenes because it removes the OH plus an adjacent hydrogen atom and we will form a double bond. Now we can have two possible products forming. We can have but1-ene or but2-ene, just depending on where which side the hydrogen comes from. So if I just draw out this molecule, we have CH3, CHOH, CH2, CH3. So this is butan 2 all. So of course we're going to remove this OH. If we remove the OH here on the right hand side we are going to form but2-ene and if we remove the H from the left hand side we're going to form but1-ene. So just be aware that you can have major and minor products but you're not required to go into a lot of detail about these. One of the most important parts of this topic is the oxidation of alcohols. Now this is something that will come up in Unit 2, Unit 3, as it is also a core practical, and you will also come back to it in Units 4 and 5 when you get to A2 as well. So the oxidation of an alcohol molecule involves the loss of a hydrogen that is attached to a carbon atom and the hydrogen atom that is on the OH group. So we have this OH and this hydrogen being lost and we're forming this carbonyl group here. So it's very important that we can distinguish between that this is our hydroxyl and this is a carbonyl group, this C double bonded to an O. Now tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized because they don't have this hydrogen atom on the the carbon of the COH group. So you can see here that this is actually an alkyl group, so these do not undergo oxidation. So we're only going to be focusing on primary and secondary in terms of oxidation. So if we start with secondary, secondary alcohols can be oxidized to an organic product that is known as a ketone, and they have this general formula RCOR, and that just means we have any alkyl group, a carbonyl, and then any alkyl group. So the carbonyl group appears in the middle of the chain. So an example of this would be propan 2 all going to propanone. So propanone being our ketone, and we can see that it's a ketone because it ends in this O-N-E. And this is the formula where we would have CH3, the carbonyl group, and a CH3. And we're going to form water here. Now the oxidizing agent you can see is simply written as O in brackets. That's because we don't need to know much about the actual oxidizing agents themselves other than the fact that they provide oxygen. So the oxidizing agent that can be used is acidified potassium dichromate. And when we get this secondary alcohol going to the ketone, we see a color change from orange to green. That tells us that an oxidation has taken place. Primary alcohols are slightly different because they can be oxidized in two different stages. 
So the first stage is to form an aldehyde, which has this general formula RCHO. And the second stage is to form a carboxylic acid, which is RCOOH. So if we're looking at an example of this, well, we've got propan 1 ol our primary, reacting with our, our oxidizing agent, and we're going to form this propanal. So propanal is going to be drawn out as CH3, CH2, C, double bonded to the O, plus a hydrogen. This can then be further oxidized in order to form our propanoic acid. And if we write out propanoic acid, we have CH3, CH2, C, O, O, H. And we've got the general equation down here. So we have our primary alcohol reacting with our oxidizing agent to form an aldehyde, which can then be further oxidized to form a carboxylic acid. So this is a nice summary of each of them. And you can see that going forward is going to be our oxidizing. So when we have this O, it means the oxidizing agent. Now you can reverse these reactions and that is what the H is and this is our reducing agent but you do not need to know much about the reducing reaction or the reduction reaction sorry that is something that is going to be discussed later on in the A level usually in A2. So just to go through again we have our primary alcohol being oxidized to an aldehyde which is then further oxidized to a carboxylic acid. A secondary alcohol being oxidized to a ketone and is then not oxidized any further. And a tertiary alcohol cannot be oxidized at all. We can carry out chemical tests in order to look at these alcohols to see what has been oxidized and what, um, if we can identify them. So there are three different ways that we can look at and these come up in the analysis of un unknown substances core practical so please feel free to check that video out as well the first test that we can do is we can warm it with acidified potassium dichromate and we get a color change from an orange to a green this tells us that we either have a primary or secondary alcohol because an oxidation is taking place or we have an aldehyde going to a carboxylic acid Alternatively, we can heat with failings or Benedict solution and we get a red precipitate being formed and this is a test for an aldehyde. If you have a ketone, you will see no colour change. And we can also react it with Tollens reagent and we form a silver mirror and again, this tells us that we have an aldehyde and if we have a ketone, we get no colour change. We can do a number of different tests to see if we have carbonyls but again we'll revisit those in IA2. These are the three tests that you have to know. So if we have potassium dichromate with a colour change it's either a primary or secondary alcohol or an aldehyde or the feelings or the tollens will give you a positive test for an aldehyde. Now, if we focus on the oxidation of primary alcohols, we also have to take into account the fact that there are two methods of preparation, depending on how much oxidation we want. If we want full oxidation and we want to make our carboxylic acid, we're going to use this method, which is known as heating under reflux. If we want partial oxidation, where we're going to form our aldehyde, then we're going to use this method, which is distillation with addition. You need to be able to sketch these and label them because it does come up in, a, in an exam in both units two and unit three. So let's go into just a little bit more detail about each of them. So heating under reflux is when we want to make our carb carboxylic acid. Now the alcohol and the oxidizing agent, which are going to be in our reaction mixture, are very volatile because we're going to be heating here. When we heat this and they are volatile, they're going to escape and, of course, being able to start to rise up the condenser. Now, the condenser here is going to be wrapped around 
this tube in the center and it is going to have cold water being put in. This collects the vapors and it turns them back into liquids and it actually causes them to go back down into the heating flask. So the vapors do not escape and we keep everything in the flask until the oxidation is fully carried out. We can also add something called anti-bumping granules and that just makes sure that we get a nice smooth boiling and we get boiling all the way through our entire mixture. If we have the distillation with addition set up, then we use this in order to, deter to get an aldehyde. So again, we're going to have to have some heat. And what we do is we heat the oxidizing mixture. So this would be your potassium dichromate or whichever oxidizing agent you wish to use. And we slowly add the alcohol from this funnel here. And you can see that it can drop through down into the oxidizing mixture. Now, as the aldehyde forms, it has got a much lower boiling point than the alcohol that is used to make it. So the aldehyde boiling point is smaller than the alcohol boiling point. So what that means is it's going to automatically turn into a vapor. It's going to pass through the condenser here, turn into a liquid and be collected in this flask in the receiver. And this is your aldehyde mixture. And in theory, the only thing that you should have left in your oxidizing mixture is your any oxidizing agent that's left over and any alcohol that has not reacted. Now, when we make any sort of organic liquid, we always have to purify it because we want to make sure that we are getting rid of any impurities and we have uh, a pure product that's not going to have any sort of issues if we want to use it in the pharmaceutical industry or for various different reasons. So we use different methods in order to separate our intended product from our reaction mixture. And depending on whether the intended mixture is a gas, a liquid or a solid, will determine what different techniques that we use. Now you've met some of these before and these will again come back up in topic 20 of organic synthesis at A2. And that will, we can go into more detail there, but let's cover the key ones that we have to know now. So simple distillation you met back in GCSE. This is to obtain a liquid product that has a lower boiling point than others in the reaction mixture. And it should be by at least 25 degrees Celsius. So if, for example, we had a mixture of ethanol and water, ethanol has a boiling point of 78 and water has a boiling point of 100. So we can actually separate out the ethanol from the water using simple distillation where we simply heat the reaction mixture and the vapors pass through the condenser and are collected into a flask and as long as the temperature remains steady it means that we're making the same product during our distillation if the temperature changes and we see a spike then we're making a new product and we would have to then change out our round bottom flask we can also use fractional distillation. Now you have seen fractional distillation in, on a larger scale when you've been talking about separating crude oil, but we can do it in a laboratory and a very much of a smaller scale. Most of it is si very similar to simple distillation. The addition that we have though is this fractionating column, which is this column right here, which is filled with glass beads or broken glass. Now these act as surfaces in order for the vapour to condense and be re-evaporated as more hot vapour passes through the column. And what that basically does is it allows for better separation. So we get constant condensing and evaporation happening within the column. And the more it condenses and the more it evaporates, the better it is going to be to separate. And then by the time the vapors get up to the condenser, again, they pass through and they go into the round bottom flask to be collected. Now, if we have an organic product where we want to remove it using a solvent, we can do this thing called solvent extraction, where we use a separating funnel. And again, this comes up in the core practicals. So the solvent that we want the to mix with our substance should be immiscible with the solvent containing the product. 
Okay, and the desired product should be more soluble in the added solvent. So basically what we'll have is we'll have uh, a liquid that contains our desired product. We're going to add in a solvent that will allow us to take the liquid from the initial solvent and go into this new one. And what happens is we place it into the separating funnel. So we have our initial liquid placed into the separating funnel with a new solvent. It is then agitated and the pressure is released by putting a, taking the stopper out. And then what we should see is we should get two layers. Now, typically the organic layer is on top and the aqueous at the bottom, but it can depend on what solvent it is that you're using. So they may flip around. But what matters is that you know which solvent it is that you want. So you can then open the tap and allow the mixture to drain. And then close the tap once this level here comes down to there. And then you discard that layer if you do not need the bottom one. And then you take allow the rest of it to go out and to drain into a different flask. We would then undergo distillation in order to get the exact organic product that we want. If we have an organic solid, then we can use a drying technique. And this is very, very simple, where we simply just leave it in a warm place or we leave it in something called a desiccator, which is this diagram here. And we use a suitable drying agent and the purpose of that drying agent is to remove any water from the organic solid or even an organic liquid if necessary. So the most common drying agents are anhydrous metal salts such as calcium chloride and it absorbs the water as a water of crystallization and we can then remove the drying agent if necessary by decanting or filtration if it is a liquid or if we have an organic liquid, sorry. If we have an organic solid, then we can simply just remove it from the desiccator. Lastly, we can test the purity of our solid um, by testing the melting point, or if it's a liquid, we can look at the boiling point. And the biggest thing with this is that if you have any impurities, you will see a range of values for your melting or boiling point. Ideally, we want to just see one small range or one, one specific value, and we can then compare these with the known values for pure compounds. Now, the problem is that with this method is that different organic compounds can sometimes have the same melting or boiling point. So if you're trying to determine between two substances that may have the same boiling point, this method would not work. So you might need to use some additional analysis, such as mass spec, or infrared and we'll discuss infrared later on in another video. So let's have a look at some past paper questions for alcohols. Well these are from the January 2019 paper and the first one is a uh, multiple choice. So we want to figure out which one is the tertiary alcohol. Is it 2-methylbutan-2-ol, 2-methylbutan-1-ol, pentan-2-ol or pentan-3-ol? Now the best way to do this is just to draw them out. So let's start off with drawing A, which is 2-methylbutan-2-ol. So we can see here that we have their OH group attacked, attached to a carbon that is not attached to any other hydrogen. So this is going to be tertiary. But let's just double check our others just to be 100% sure. So if we have 2-methylbutan-2-O, we're going to have something that looks like this. And we can see that this is going to be a primary alcohol because our OH group is attached to a carbon that only has one alkyl group. If we have pentan-2-O, that gives us five carbons with our OH. And we can see that we have our OH group being attached to 
a carbon that is attached to two alkyl groups. So this would be a secondary. And D is pentan 3 all. And again, we have our OH group attached to a carbon that is attached to two alkyl groups. So pentan 3 all would also be a secondary alcohol. Which leaves us with the answer of A. So question 19 in this paper is looking at the structure, properties and reactions of the alcohols ethanol and butan 2 all. So ethanol mixes with water in all proportions, but butan 2 all has a limited solubility in water. Part 1 asks us to name all the intermolecular forces that are present in these alcohols. Well, of course, they all con contain electrons, so they are all going to have London forces. They also have that permanent dipole, permanent dipole, due to the presence of the OH group. And because it also has that hydrogen attached to an oxygen, that can make way for hydrogen bonding. So we have all three being attacked, uh, all three intermolecular forces being present here. You get two marks for getting three of them and one mark if you get any two. If you reference anything to do with covalent bonds, then you are going to be losing marks there. So please make sure that we understand that it is the intermolecular forces. And then for two marks for part two, explain why butan 2 has a limited solubility in water. Well, we need to think about the main forces that are going to have an effect here. Now, we know that permanent dipole, permanent dipole forces typically tend to cancel each other out. So they tend not to be the strongest force overall. So really, we're going to be focusing on London forces and hydrogen bonding. So butan 2 o does form hydrogen bonds with the water. Apologies for that, but the, the problem with that is that the whilst it does form the hydrogen bonds, it does also have London forces and the London forces and Butan 2 all are the predominant force. And that just means that because they are the predominant force, they are going to, or they are the stronger force, depending on how you want to phrase it, they are going to have much more of uh, an effect and these actually limit the solubility. So the longer the hydrocarbon chain that is attached to the OH group, the more predominant the London forces are, therefore the less the, solub the, the solubility. That's why ethanol, which only has two carbons in its hydrocarbon chain, can be soluble, but butanol, which has four, is not going to be soluble. Part C is looking for the structure, so it's looking for heating both of the alcohols under reflux with acidified potassium dichromate. And then we, after refluxing, we get an organic product being formed. Now notice that we're being specific, that we're heating under reflux, and we're heating both the ethanol, which has this structure, and also the butan 2 which has this structure. So part one is asking for an organic product that is formed from ethanol and a chemical test to show the functional group that is present. Well, because we're heating it under reflux, we're going to be doing a complete oxidation, which means that we're going to be making a carboxylic acid. And in particular, we are looking to make ethanoic acid. Any chemical test that we can use for ethanoic acid? Well, there are various different tests that we can use. We can be looking at how it reacts to form an ester. We could also be looking for a neutralization reaction, but the most common one is to simply add a metal, 
such as magnesium, and we should see effervescence. If we also want to have something else for effervescence, we could also say that we can add sodium carbonate. And we get effervescence as well. So we want to then give the structure for the organic compound that is formed from butan 2 So butan 2 we can see as a secondary alcohol. So we are going to be forming a ketone. And because it just says structure, it doesn't matter how you want to say it, but uh, sorry, how you want to draw it. So I'm gonna draw out the full structural formula. So I have my four carbons and where my OH was is now going to be a carbonyl group. And then I just add in the remainder of my hydrogens. And it doesn't ask it for it, but to make you aware, this is butanone. So you can see then that we've got the mark schemes in order for you to check the answers for each of these. And you can go back and try them again if you want. And you can find lots of other past paper questions on alcohols through different websites or you can check the individual unit 2 past papers. I hope this video has been helpful and if you do have any questions please do not hesitate to ask them in the comments and if there's anything else that you need in terms of topics that you want to revise please 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 let me know and I hope to see you back on the, the channel soon.